Welcome to The Debrief, everyone. Actor Jesse Smollett is countersuing the city of Chicago for prosecuting him, then dropping charges in an alleged racist and homophobic attack authorities say Smollett made up to advance his career. A 49-page counterclaim says Chicago police officers and prosecutors ignored evidence that the attack on Smollett was, in fact, real. Body cam footage showed Smollett with a noose around his neck after his manager called police. Smollett was on the phone with his manager when he said he was attacked. Police say the alleged attackers told them Smollett asked them to attack him. Chicago wants Smollett to pay $130,000 to reimburse costs related to the investigation. Let's jump in and discuss this case. Attorneys Mike Korobanics and Brian Buckmeyer are here first tonight. So, Brian, Smollett's really digging in his heels on this case. He's saying this was a real attack. It's wrong for the police to say that I set it up. And by the way, I'm going to go back after the city. Yeah, I get it. You've got to stick to your guns. The cross claim, I don't think it has any teeth to it. Uh, I was speaking to Mike Corbonics earlier about this, and I think the only thing that makes sense is you've got to preserve your rights to some of these arguments for down the line. That's possible. Mike Corbonics, civil litigation counterclaims not uncommon, so this is a civil case. It's not a huge surprise to see it, but tactically, it's a strange response. I, I, don't, I think they're just doing it to preserve it. I think in a lot of the rules of civil procedure across the country, it's use it or lose it. If you don't plead it, you're going to waive it. And I think they are using it as maybe some leverage. And maybe to knock down the amount of the damages, possibly, because if it goes on, it goes on and it can get nasty. So uh, Brian Buckmeyer again, Smollett saying police botched the case. They should have handled it differently. Uh, again, a real attack here. Uh, that, is that going to get him anywhere in what he's claiming against the city? I think what it's going to try to get him, or what he's probably thinking it's going to get him, is you're trying to counterpunch. You're trying to say, hey, I'm going to work a better deal if I punch equally as hard or harder. Do I think it's going to be successful? I'm not sure. I think this is playing with fire, and he might end up burned. Interesting opinions here on that case tonight. Moving on now, new evidence in the case of a Boston College student accused of encouraging her boyfriend to kill himself. In Young Yu stands accused of involuntary manslaughter after authorities say she encouraged her boyfriend's suicide on his graduation day. Yu is overseas, but is planning to return to Massachusetts to fight the charge. The prosecutor says Yu was physically, verbally, and psychologically abusive to her boyfriend, but text messages released by the defendant's PR firm say she also texted her boyfriend, stop, if you ever loved me, stop, and if you want to show me you love me, stop, please pick up, talk to me, please. The PR firm says the messages proved the defendant was trying to prevent the suicide. And also with us tonight here on The Debrief, attorneys Gigi Gonzalez from Miami and Byron Brown in Phoenix. So Byron, Massachusetts has this involuntary manslaughter law. It's a judge-designed law. It turns into sort of a catch-all when there's a death that authorities want to prosecute. Do the text messages, though, basically exonerate this woman who's accused of involuntary manslaughter? I don't think they exonerate her. I mean, what we're seeing is a small snippet. If memory serves me correctly, we're talking about a, a different of the thousands of text messages that she sent, uh, supposedly occur, uh, uh, sorry, encouraging him to kill himself. So I think them pulling out this one out of context, um, we don't know what was going on. If, if that text message is related to the time that he was going to jump or not. Um, maybe it is, but again, it's one small snippet that I don't think exonerates her in and of herself. Gigi Gonzalez, your take on this. I think it's definitely compelling. You know, in the, it's interesting because in the Carter case, which is, you know, the case that we are going to be comparing this one to, uh, she's, uh, Carter allegedly encouraged him at the last moment to get back in the car and complete the suicide. Where in this case, she's encouraging him to pull back on the suicide. So yes, it's definitely an interesting take because she was physically, uh, emotionally, and psychologically abusive to this person. But at this last moment when he's deciding whether he should or shouldn't jump, she's telling him not to. Yeah, the time, frame, the time frame may be the critical point of this. I agree with you, Gigi, because I read the case law during the Carter case. Moving on again, a convicted Florida killer today learned he will not be sent to death row. The same jury that convicted Henry Segura found him guilty as charged in the deaths of his girlfriend's son and her daughters, found that he should not face the death penalty. Even though the jury found enough evidence existed to put Segura to death, the jury decided to spare his life. Segura told police he wasn't at the victim's house where the killings happened, but later admitted he was there. Still, unknown DNA and Peter's 
Victim Brandy Peters alleged connections to a drug cartel led Segura's defense to present evidence that the cartel is the one who killed the mother. One cartel member even testified that he ordered the hit. The jury didn't believe the defense. Here was the ultimate decision from that jury. As to the death penalty, uh, having unanimously found that at least one aggravating factor has been established beyond a reasonable doubt, Section A, that the aggravating factors are sufficient to warrant the sentence of death, Section B, and the aggravating factors outweigh the mitigating circumstances, Section D, we the jury unanimously find that Henry Segura should not be sentenced to death as to each of the four counts. All right, Mr. Segura, based upon the jury verdict in this case on each of the four counts, I do adjudicate you guilty of each of those counts. On each count, I sentence you to life in prison. Um, Counts two, three, and four will run concurrently with each other, but consecutively to count one. So there'll be two consecutive sentences of life. Earlier, the defendant ordered his attorneys to stop defending him even as he faced possible execution. Here's how the judge handled that request at the beginning of this penalty phase of the case. I'm thinking that whoever's responsible for these crimes deserve the death penalty. If they feel I'm guilty, then they should sentence me to death. So you understand by taking this action, it is going to increase the likelihood that the uh, jury will come back and recommend a death penalty and that ultimately um, I would order a death penalty if they so recommend it. Yes. Uh, and that's what you want to happen? Yes. I don't want to argue the death penalty, but if I could have a presentation from some, some of my family members, I could, would appreciate it. All right. So, so you've got to change your mind. You'd like to present some evidence to the jury. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. After a brief break and some procedural business, Segura told his attorneys he did change his mind again. Then the judge addressed the defendant for a second time. I will require them to present the evidence to me. So if what you're trying to do is avoid it being presented in court, it's, it's going to be presented at some point in time because I have to make a decision also, not just the jury. Do, do you understand that? Yes. Um, does that change your mind about what you want to do here today? No. So you instructed your attorney not to present any evidence, is that correct? Yes. And you've instructed your attorneys not to um, make any argument contrary to the death penalty, is that correct? And are calling any witnesses. Right. And that's what you want to occur here today? Yes. And do you have any questions about what you're doing? No. Um, anybody pressured you into doing this? No. Anybody kind of made any kind of threats against you to try to make you do this? No. This is your own personal decision? Yes. Penalty phases of cases like this begin with the state's aggravating factors, and usually those are followed by the defendant's mitigating factors. Here, though, was the state side of the case. As an aggravating circumstance for Brandy Peters, you can consider the fact that at the time she was killed, that also Tamiah Peters was killed, that Taniah Peters was killed, and that Javante Segura was killed. The defendant's child support didn't involve the twins. The only reason to eliminate them was because there were potential witnesses in the case. Same could apply for Javante Segura. The crime was committed in a heinous, atrocious, or cruel way, in a cold, calculated, and premeditated manner, without any pretense of moral or legal justification. Tamaya, Tania, and Javante were all less than 12 years of age. They were six years old, six years old, and three year old. At the conclusion of this penalty phase, the state will be asking you to determine that the death sentence is the appropriate sentence for the crimes Mr. Sura committed against Brandy Peters, Tamaya Peters, Tania Peters, and Javante Segura. The defense honored Henry Segura's request and declined to give an opening statement or even present evidence. So the state put the victim's autopsy reports on the record and then went straight into closing arguments. 
if he wanted to eliminate Brandy Peters or eliminate Javante Segura, he didn't have to kill these two little girls. He had a plan. We know he had a plan. He went in either knowing they were there or not caring they were there, that he was going to kill everybody there. If they weren't killed, they could have walked in this courtroom, walked up and got on that stand and said, this is the man that killed my mama. This is the man that killed my little brother. We have Javante. It wasn't necessary that he kill him. He too could have identified the defendant in this case as being the killer of his mama. The defendant's plan included going there and doing that killing and killing these witnesses. Because where were they earlier in the day? They weren't necessarily at home. He could have planned this when they weren't there. He could have lured Brandy Peters away from the home and did it there. But he elected not to. The state did not get what it wanted ultimately with those requests. Let's go back now to attorneys Brian Buckmeyer and Mike Korobanek. So, Brian, what do you make of the defendant sitting there and saying, oh, just don't put on any case for me, but then the judge saying, well, I'm going to receive it just in case there's an appeal or in case I need to look at it? Because in theory, the judge could overturn what the jury requests. If the jury had requested death, the judge could say, no, I'm going to say life. Yeah, my, I have no issue with the defendant saying, hey, I don't want to present a case as it is to the death penalty. My issue is more with the, with the defense counsel. It's your obligation as a lawyer to do that. This trial strategy is not up to the defendant. Linda Kenny Bottom always says they have the right to testify, the right to take pleas. Trial strategy is yours. And if you're fighting for someone's life, it's your job to do so whether or not they want you to. Mike Korobanex, we can't erase the conviction, but is this a fair sentence? I, I'm not a pro-death penalty person, but I don't think if you follow the law, this is a fair sentence, because if you follow the law, the death, uh, we spoke earlier, there's no more heinous crime than killing your own child. And I just can't understand how the jury didn't follow logic or the law in this matter. It may have been a mercy verdict. Let's move on to our other panelists now, Byron Brown in Phoenix, Gigi Gonzalez in Miami. So Gigi, you practice in Florida. What's your assessment of the sentence and the defendant's choice to basically go it alone? You know, it, it's uncommon. You know, it's, it's uncommon for the defendant to all of a sudden abandon the defense uh, at the last go. You know, this is the very last opportunity to be heard by the defense in order to I mean, you know, he was trying, I think maybe picking his poison gun or, or poison, right? Like, am I going to spend the rest of my life in, behind bars or am I eventually going to be put to death? Either way, I'm going to be in prison for the rest of my life. So maybe at that moment, he just gave up and said, look, listen, why put on any more presentations? I'm already punished. Let's just get on with it. Yeah, I mean, in this case, this strategy, bizarre as it is, actually worked. Byron Brown, the lead attorney, though, left Segura's counsel table when Segura said he wanted to go this alone. But the other attorneys remained there. What's your assessment of that body language? That they don't agree with. I think that's, that's clear. I think the, um, the, the, the lawyers wanted to fight. The lawyers wanted to present evidence. Um, it seems to me that they disagreed with that. And the fact that the fact of the matter is, is they still could have gone after it and they still could have pled, um, but they didn't. So um, I just don't think they agreed with it. And they were forced, maybe in their opinion, to listen to their client. And that's what happened. And uh, we saw the upshot of it. Thanks a lot to both of you, because still ahead tonight, the trial of another Florida man accused of murdering his wife and business partner. The state's key witness takes the stand. But will the jury believe him? We are back with the trial of a Florida man accused of killing his wife and business partner. Mark Sievers is charged with the, being the ringleader behind the murder of Dr. Teresa Sievers. A colleague found the doctor beaten to death in her own home. The murder weapon, a hammer. Mark Sievers, the husband, is one of three men accused in the case. Curtis Wright pleaded guilty and agreed to testify against Jimmy Rogers and against Mark Sievers. Curtis is serving a 25-year sentence. Before we get to Wright's key testimony, let's start where the day began with prosecutors saying that Mark Sievers and Curtis Wright texted using a code. Other apparently meant to switch the conversation to their disposable burner phones. On May 5th, 2015 at 7.08 p.m. to Wayne Wright, just got it, mailed tomorrow. This was on May 7th, 2015 at 2.32 p.m. to Wayne Wright, mailing out today. Call me, it's very simple. 
on May 7, 2015 at 2.45 p.m. to Wayne Wright. Since neither one of us are likely to carry both with us, whenever you want to use the other one, just text me, in quotes, other, and then when I call, I will call. When I can, I will call. May 9th, 2015, at 12.20 a.m. to Wayne Wright. Did you get mail? It was on May 9th, 2015, at 7.51 p.m. to Wayne Wright. Call late if you want. Text because you never know. Uh, May 17th, 2015, at 5.47 p.m. from Wayne Wright. Check other. May 17th, 2015, at 7.11 p.m. to Wayne Wright. Hello, brother from, in quotes, other mother. On Cross, the defense said the state cell phone report only showed a portion of the texts. After Lee, a lengthy rather cross-examination, the judge sent the jury out for a break and then had this to say to the attorneys. It's not my business if people want to beat a dead horse on each side, and I think both sides have made their point. But if you guys want to alienate the jury, that's between each of you. Um, I think the defense made their point that there were several that it was a redacted version or truncated version that was entered, and you said you're going to enter yours in during your case in chief, which is fine. Um, but if you got, I think you made your point with the first 10, and the state yielded. State made their point with the 6,000 pages they mentioned. You want to go through this, this is fine. But I'll tell you what is my business, that we're going to finish this trial on, on time, and if that means we stay to midnight and I break my promise to the jury, I'm going to do it because we're gonna finish this trial on time. And if this is any indication of how every witness is gonna be, pack a dinner, because we're gonna start staying late. On schedule, ladies and gentlemen, now to the testimony of star witness Curtis Wright. Prosecutors say Wright was a longtime friend to the defendant and the defense complained during opening statements that detectives tried to suggest the victim was worried that Wright and her husband, the defendant, were having a side fling of all things. Seavers traveled to Missouri for Wright's wedding in May 2015 and allegedly asked his friend for one big favor. That he, that she was leaving him, that he couldn't let her take the kids away from him. And again, said that they were in danger, some kind of danger, uh, without him there to be able to protect them. Did he ask me to do anything? Um, yeah, we talked about some more, op this, really it was the same options, just brought back up. When we kind of exhausted that, he, he told me that really the only option that he had was for her to die. And he said that he needed to have her killed. On your wedding day, or on your drive to pick up wheat, meat for your wedding, Mr. Severs is telling you that he wants to have his wife killed. Yes. He asked me to help him. I mean, what kind of help was he asking for? Well, he, it was pretty direct. He asked me to, if I could, if I would kill her or take care of it. <laughs> Wright says he secured the help of another friend and wedding attendee, Jimmy Rogers, to help with the hit. The two bought coveralls, duct tape, and industrial gloves. Then, Wright says they made a fateful drive from Missouri to Florida. I panicked. I jumped up and I followed her into the house. I hit her with the hammer. Where I, where I hit her at was she, she was turning to the right, not necessarily the back of the head, but kind of the side. I actually think that she thought I was Mark. Um, she said, why? Right after that third, the third time I swung, um, Jimmy came from my right side and just started, started blasting her over and over and over. Uh, I think she actually had one hand on the countertop, but he just kept hitting her and then so she ended up going down onto the floor, and after she was on the floor face down, he continued to hit her. When he kept hitting her on the floor, I, I asked him a couple of times, to, you know, I said, Jimmy, stop, you know, is it enough? And, uh, but he wouldn't stop, so I, uh, I actually went over there and put my hand on his shoulder and just like, you know, like, stop. Let's go back now to our guests, Byron Brown and Gigi Gonzalez. Gigi, this is horrible testimony. We saw family members in the gallery breaking down in tears and the defendant breaking down in tears. The jury's looking at all that body language in that courtroom. Absolutely, and the jury's watching everything and it's definitely powerful when you see the family of the victim sobbing and the defendant sobbing. And granted, I mean, they 
all of them lost somebody. Teresa Sievers was a defendant's wife, and she was also the sister and aunt and friend of all of these people in, in the stands. This is a very emotional time, and the jury is reading all of this and making interpretations as to you know what side they believe. Byron Brown, the tears of the relatives, I'm sure, are sincere. The question on the minds of perhaps some jurors is whether or not the tears of the defendant are sincere. I, I don't think the tears of the defendant are sincere. I just think the way that he's sitting there taking notes, conveniently crying at maybe the right time, I do not believe that a jury is going to buy what he's trying to sell. I think that the testimony of the key witnesses overcome anything he's trying to do by selling his own emotion as it relates to maybe being surprised or saddened by what happened. Let's turn to our in-house panel now here in the Law and Crime Studios in New York. Mike Korobanix, you're a former prosecutor, current criminal defense attorney. As a prosecutor, do you worry about things like that? And as a defense attorney, do you tell your clients, oh, make sure you break down and cry so that you look like you're not guilty? You, <clears throat> you usually tell your clients to just sit there and be as stoic as they can. You explain that to the jury in your summations. If I'm the prosecutor and he's crying like that, I think I'd take a step stand right behind them and keep asking my questions and let the jury know how inappropriate these his re reactions are to my questions. Mike Korobanix, with the prosecutor's viewpoint, you're lucky to be in a jurisdiction that lets you move away from a lectern or a table to ask the questions, because in some places, you can't do that, right? Correct. Uh, in, in Brooklyn, you're allowed to move around. As a defense attorney, I would not tell my client to do anything. I want him to be as natural as possible. If he's going to cry, he's going to cry. If he's not going to cry, he's not going to cry. It's my job to do the heavy lifting. And if the prosecutor is standing behind my client on summation, I'm scolding them and saying, this man is grieving. There's a reason for this. This is not a game, and he's innocent. And I just hammer hard on that. Boy, I should do this more often. I should pit the two of you against one another on my broadcast because when you're in the chair, Buckmeyer, you just get to ask him questions. I get to pitch you both against one another. Yeah, it's a lot more fun there, I guess. And Mike is and I'm the prosecutor, this. and I shake his hand and say, sorry about the conviction you gave me. <laughs> Haven't, wow. haven't got one yet, so it's still good. <laughs> Look, ladies and gentlemen, we're, we're all friends when we're not on the air. <laughs> trust me, trust me. You know, that, that's the way it is. Appreciate the insight from the panelists tonight here in New York and remotely. Thanks to those of you joining us. Our live coverage of this and other cases resumes tomorrow at 9 o'clock Eastern here on Law & Crime. The debrief, of course, back at 5 o'clock Eastern. We'll see you then.